Eagles Entertainment. With the 15th pick in the NFL Draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select... You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast. Welcome to the Journey to the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and today we have got our second to last position preview. We are almost here, just over a week away until the 2022 NFL Draft. And today we are talking wide receivers with Dane Brugler, Ben Fennell. We're going to break it down in draft buzz. All the different superlatives across the entirety of the draft. We're going to talk through the wide receiver position, obviously uh, a spot that is being highly debated, highly discussed, not just through the NFL draft, but also through free agency. And this offseason, a lot of talk about the wide receiver. So we'll get into that there with Dane and Ben in draft buzz. After that, the three of us will go through our on the clock uh, exercise. Three new teams. We're going to find some players for them uh, throughout the course of the draft. Make sure you stay tuned for that part of the podcast and then after that we'll wrap things up a couple good questions there to finish things off here in draft mailbag as always the best way to reach us head on over to apple podcasts or spotify or stitcher wherever you listen leave us a rating leave us a comment appreciate everybody that has thrown us your support here lately here on the podcast again just over a week away until the NFL draft. So the best way to hit us up, throw us your support. If you've been listening all year, all draft season, now's the time. Jump on, leave us a review. If you've got a question, get it in. Before the draft gets here, we'll answer it here on one of our upcoming episodes. A lot of good stuff here down the pipe as we get closer and closer to draft weekend. That said, let's get things started. It's time to talk wideouts and draft buzz. Now it's time for draft buzz. All right, excited to talk wide receivers here with Ben Fennell and Dane Brugler. And guys, uh, wide receiver, as I mentioned at the top, uh, this is a position that is being highly debated, highly discussed with uh, the Tyreek Hill and Devontae Adams. You go on down the list of uh, big name after big name, not just changing teams this year, but really over the last couple of years. And you're seeing the contracts being handed out for these wide receivers. It's made the rookie class uh, a big subject of debate. And so with that said, we'll do what we've done for each of the last several weeks. And we'll just kind of go superlative by superlative, hit on certain areas of the draft. Uh, Dane, you're going to take the day one players. Ben, you'll have day two. I will take up the caboose here today uh, with day three at wide receiver. And our first category, we're going to hit the best big play threat. It's a big play league. Who creates them better than anybody in this class? Dane, uh, we'll come to you. And I feel like this is a, uh, an easy option here. Yeah, well, I appreciate you giving me the the day one guys because there, there's a lot to choose from here. Uh, Got to go, Jamison Williams, Alabama um, of Alabama's eleven longest plays last year. Jamison Williams was responsible for ten of them. Uh, special, special speed really puts defend uh, defenders in conflict, uh, and he's more than just a track athlete. Uh, he can decelerate on command. He can set up double moves. He can snap off ninety degree cuts uh, without sacrificing any of that speed. So. Uh, tracks the ball well, has length to adjust to the to the to the football downfield, and I think just aside from the scouting when you watch him, just when you watched Alabama on Saturdays in the fall, you felt like Alabama was a play away every single time because Jamison Williams was on the field, and so. Day one option for best big play threat has to have to go Jameson Williams. Yeah, it was a, an easy selection there for you for our first category. Jameson Williams, uh, one of the biggest uh, playmaking threats, regardless of position in the uh, in this draft. Ben, uh, how about you for day two? Who's a guy that stands out from that standpoint? Yeah, a number of different options to go here on day two, you know, depending on who's going to be off the board there and uh, who maybe I think has better value than the day three picks. But I'm going to go with another guy in that more than a track athlete, more than a track star playing football conversation. And that's Calvin Austin, the third out of Memphis, who had the prolific track career, walked on to the Memphis football team, had to put on some weight and has really turned into a very well-rounded receiver, can beat press coverage, tracks the ball very well, throttles in and out of his breaks extremely well, which is tough for these explosive, linear, fast guys. Great yards after catch and some bubble screens, his elusiveness, can beat press coverage, has really good play strength, and I think he's more than just the -the over-the-top guy. And we've seen this diminutive size and speed kind of win in the NFL, whether it's Deshaun Jackson's or Taylor Gabriel's, Travis Benjamin's, I like the Isaiah McKenzie type of comp for him with that kind of thick, short profile, really good player for the Buffalo Bills. So Calvin Austin, the third, much more than just that track background. He is a big play receiving threat. 
I love that. A, a guy that it's really hard to not like his film when you go and watch Calvin Austin, like just a, such a fun player. Uh, Dan, you and I got to see him up close to the senior bowl. He was one of the best players down there. Uh, absolutely. Throughout the course of the week in practice in mobile. So a uh, really good selection there from you, Ben. For I've me, enjoyed watching Memphis the past few years. Whether there's yeah, Antonio Gibson no or Pollard or Kenny Gainwell, some of the old linemen that have come out or even transferred. I yep. put on that Memphis offense. I don't know. I just sit up in my chair and just the, 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 the tape just looks a little brighter. Yeah, it feels like Paxton Lynch is like the line of demarcation after Paxton <laughs> Lynch. Uh, it feels like everybody has been really impressive from that offense. Uh, for me, I'm going to go with Tyquan Thornton, one of the other darlings from the combine because of uh, him running sub 4-3, but he's more than just the sub 4-3. Ben, you you texted me a couple weeks ago and you're like, it's just randomly, you're like, man, Tyquan Thornton can block. And it's like, yeah, that's the thing with Tyquan Thornton is that he's not just the, the speed over the top guy. He'll do some dirty work for you as well. Uh, I remember talking when he first got to campus, uh, this is a few years ago now, you know, 20, 2018, I think was his first year down there for Baylor and Waco and talking with members of that staff that I had worked with at Temple. I said, yeah, they, he kind of reminds us of, of Robbie Anderson a little bit. And you could see that from that, you know, that lean slender build. I mean, it's just over 180 pounds, over six foot two. Um, but he does a little bit more of the grunt work than what, than, uh, than what Ty, or than what Robbie Anderson did when he was at Temple. I think when you look at Thornton, uh, this is a guy that can absolutely win over the top. He can win with the ball in his hands and the screen game um, but with some of the other things that he brings to the table I think he's got he's got a really good shot to be able to stick early Ben you and I talked about the the guys that have that special teams value uh, in last week's episode on Thursday Thornton is one of those guys that yeah he brings you that speed and that's going to help you on offense but he could do some things uh, on special teams and on the run in the run game as well it wouldn't shock me if you were able to make it be one of those kinds of players uh, for his future franchise in the NFL so a uh, guy I wanted to make sure I gave some love to let's go to the next one here best route runner who shows the best ability to create their own separation such a key key part of winning in today's game. Dane, uh, let's go for you for the best separator. I uh, need to go with Chris Olave here. Yep. Uh, he, he's his route acceleration is outstanding. Uh, he, he's so good at eliminating cushions, uh, creating conflict for, for zone or off, co off coverage. Uh, he can win early with his releases. Uh, he's very controlled. He doesn't drift. Uh, and it's just very smooth. I mean, everyone, when we talk about Chris Olave, they always use the same word smooth and it's repetitive, but it just fits. That's, that's how he plays. That's how his, his routes, uh, it's how it's, uh, his adjustments. So I uh, talk about creating your own, uh, yardage with your routes, finding the blind spot of, the uh, defenders, creating those windows that that's Chris Olave. That's what he does best. That's what's going to keep him in the NFL for a long time. And it's what he's always done best. That's been him like going back to studying him in like 2019, 2020. Yeah. That's how Chris Olave has always played. He's just a really, really impressive player. Ben, uh, day two, who do you like here? Man, it's going to pain me to not pick Jahan Dotson here, but <laughs> I got to go with Sky Moore out of Western Michigan. This day two is just a, uh, what do you call it, of riches? An embarrassment of riches. Embarrassment of riches. I feel like this is the third time in the podcast. I couldn't think of that <laughs> moniker there. I got to get a new one. But yeah, it pains me not to go with Jahan Dotson here, going with Sky Moore out of Western Michigan. Day two receivers, just plentiful this year. But Sky Moore, his release package, his instant acceleration off the line of scrimmage, getting in and out of breaks, his ability to win down the field, separate vertically, very twitchy, very sudden and almost everything he does a lot of rpo in breakers off that run game action where you can watch him just kind of show that full release package in different ways to kind of get to those slant windows he's a guy that wins at the catch point can separate he's a really fun receiver a lot of press coverage as well too so i know you're thinking western michigan a lot of mac football they got up in his face and he had to beat some corners you know face to face with them go watch the pit game against some of those corners uh, Narduzzi's defense, but Sky Moore, really impressive, really twitched up route runner. I mean, the Mac has put out a lot of big time receivers over the course of the, of the last you know decade and a half, two decades. You go back to Randy Moss coming out of the Mac. I mean, there, there have been some quality receivers coming out of the Mac and uh, we'll see. Sky Moore could be next up on that list. For me on day three, I'm going to go with Kyle Phillips from UCLA. Uh, and this is a guy that's undersized for certain. I mean, 5'11", but 189 pounds, really short arms, really tiny hands. But I think when you look at his ability to get in and out of breaks, that's where he stands out. And I think when you look at Phillips, just one of the more crisp route runners in this class, 
He gets in and out well. Like I said, he knows how to attack technique, get corners flipped around. He steps on toes. And what do I mean by that is that he gets up on defenders. And now you don't, if you're, you are forcing the corner to kind of break down, is he going to break inside, break outside? Is he going to continue to act or to uh, approach vertically and attack downfield? Or is he going to cut back uh, towards the quarterback? He's got that ability to understand how to attack a corner, put him, you know, put him in stress. And then his, his pacing, he's always changing up uh, his pacing in his routes. He settles in the soft spots really well in zone coverage. So uh, a really good double move receiver, Kyle Phillips, just one of the more crisp route runners in this class. I think he's one of the pure, best pure traditional uh, underneath slot weapons in this class and also an outstanding punt returner. I mean, it, I think he averaged just under 28 yards per punt return in his career, two touchdowns on special teams. So uh, Kyle Phillips, what he does as a route runner uh, really helps stand out. Now let's go to the next one here. Receiver, we're talking about catching the football. Best ball skills. Who is the best ball winner? The, the, the downfield tracking, adjusting to the football. Overall hands. Uh, we'll grow, group it all into uh, one category here. Best ball skills. Dane, day one, go. For this category, it came down to Drake London and Garrett Wilson for mm. me. Uh, but London gets the edge. Uh, basically, because he's four-plus inches taller. He's got longer arms, bigger body. Uh, you know, all the basketball cliches fit with him. Uh, plays above the rim, boxes out defensive backs. You know, that basketball background, certainly, you see that on the football field. Uh, you do worry about the lack of vertical separation. Uh, that That's fair. But, you know, they, let's, let's be honest. Uh, him not running a 40-yard dash translation, I am just wasn't running fast enough in, in training. And that's okay. You're not watching Drake London and saying, okay, this guy's a burner. So, uh, but when you do watch Drake London, you feel about his game about, okay, this guy just goes to gets the football every single time. He's strong through contact. The catch radius is outstanding. Uh, he, he can scoop the ball off the ground. He can pull it down from the clouds. Uh, he has that type of radius uh, and, and defenders. He's just, they don't want to go up against him because of how strong he is, how he does have the lower body fluidity of a smaller player. So there's a lot you could do with Drake London. Uh, and I think the ball skills are a big part of how he wins. That's a big part of it. And even comparing him and Garrett Wilson, uh, London's got that ability to win in different, in more ways, I guess, than, than Wilson, right. In terms of uh, his ability to finish as a pass catcher, Ben, who do you like here day two? I gotta go with George Pickens out of Georgia. He's a guy that plays extremely strong, extremely competitive, and really, uh, you know, has an interesting profile with kind of his explosive gear to win vertically as well. But he plays very balanced and very under control to kind of know when to throttle down and make plays on those back shoulders or maybe just to throttle down on some underthrown passes and high point the football. Very, very balanced, very strong in his lower half, almost like a low post rebounder and that he can go up and kind of uh, bang with some safeties and corners on his hips uh, at the catch point there really good in the red zone as well. He's another guy. He can wall off smaller corners on slants and things like that. He's a guy that wins at the catch point in a variety of different ways with an explosive gear with a competitive element. George Pickens checks a lot of boxes. He just maybe don't see it on a down to down basis. There's some turn on turn off tendencies with him, but when you watch his best stuff, George Pickens at the catch point, ball skills, strong hands, he checks those boxes. Yeah, no question. Hey, from day one, when he arrived at Georgia, his ability to be that ball winner on the perimeter stood out. He was their leading receiver as a freshman for a reason. Uh, the highlights uh, didn't end uh, on game day because uh, every day in practice, he was making those kinds of plays for the Bulldogs. Uh, for me, we've gone with kind of the same type of receiver here, guys, and I'm, I'm going to follow suit. I'm going to go with David Bell from Purdue, six foot uh, six one, just over 210 pounds. David Bell's not going to stand out because of his athleticism. He's not going to stand out because of his top end speed. I don't even know if he stands out with his route running. Where he stands out is at the catch point. I, I thought he was near automatic. He was outstanding, whether it was contested uh, or if he was just you know climbing the ladder, uh, making plays along the sideline. His hand-eye coordination was outstanding. Very, very few drops on tape. Uh, I was really impressed overall with it, with his ball skills, his tracking over the shoulder, uh, and then just the overall consistency at the catch point. To me, that's where David Bell really, really stands out. He is the wide receiver from Purdue. Has been ultimately, I mean, he's been extremely productive. Was a freshman All-American back in 2019. So Second team All Big Ten when when, uh, when Rondale Moore got hurt in 2020, and then in 2021, first team All American, first team All Conference, Big Ten Receiver of the Year, Bolitnikoff Award finalist. So uh, a guy that's been very very decorated, and I think his hands, his ball skills, a big big reason why. Let's now get to after the catch and the best yak guy in this class. Uh, Dane, we'll come to you for our for your day one. Who's the most dangerous with the ball in their hands? Again, Garrett Wilson, I think he's got a strong case here, uh, but I have to go Traylon Burks, Arkansas. Uh, he averaged 9.3 yards after catch this season. 
Uh, that's best out of all these guys. He led the SEC with 22 receptions of 20 plus yards. Uh, Arkansas, and they basically manufactured touches for him. Uh, and they would say, hey, go create. Uh, and more times than not, that's exactly what he did. I know the 455 40 yard dash uh, was a little disappointing at the combine. But how many times did you watch Burks and see him get caught from behind? So the runaway speed, the run strength, the toughness, to me, that's what makes him the top yak guy. And I, I did want to add this. I think it's fascinating that this is the fourth category we've done here. And Garrett Wilson hasn't been my answer for any of them, yep. but he's been a finalist for all four in my mind. And so it came down to him and another player. So even though he didn't, you know, quote unquote, win any of these categories, I do think it speaks to his well-rounded ability to do everything, get open, catch the football, create after the catch. Yeah, I think that that, that well-rounded ability certainly makes him stand out. I was going to bring that up uh, if you didn't. It was the, not the first time you had mentioned Garrett Wilson. So uh, Garrett Wilson certainly got a guy that we're going to see potentially the first receiver off the board when we get to next Thursday. Uh, ben, let's come to you now. Day two, uh, who do you like here after the catch? Well, Dane, sometimes I like to give two names, you know, here and there to cover all those bases. There's always a little yeah, pushback. Right. We call the that pulling a bend. And... Pulling a bend. Yeah, you really fennel <laughs> yeah. that one. But I got news for you. There's going to be some guys in the top 50 here we just don't get to on these superlatives just because of how deep this receiver group is. So we'll touch on that in a little bit here. But as far as day two option, most dangerous with the ball in their hands, that's got to be guys with natural hands to transition quickly from the catch. You got to be tough. You got to be loose, creative, shifty, sudden in the open field. You better have some return ability. You better have been in the backfield getting some handoffs. And that's Khalil Shakur out of Boise State, who at six foot 190, I think is a three level weapon. And however you want to use them on bubble screens, wildcat quarterback, end of rounds, jet sweeps, punt returner, quick game, let him catch and run. Surprisingly competitive at the catch point, too. He's a guy I think has really taken a back seat because of just this deep receiver group. Nobody knows really where to plug him, where to peck him, where to talk about him. Wasn't an elite tester, wasn't at an elite program, didn't show out, you know, in elite fashion at the senior bowl, but quietly a very dominant player in Khalil Shakur. So don't forget about him. I bet he goes in round three. I was hoping that one of you guys would bring him up, uh, and namely you, Ben, for, from a day two threat. Uh, I think he's really one of the more underrated players uh, in this class. For me, on day three, uh, Dane, I actually went with a player that kind of reminds me. He would be like the – Ben, you and I did the, the category a couple weeks ago of like, all right, if you don't get this guy on day one, you, know, you look for this guy later in the draft. If you miss out on Traylon Burks on day one, I feel like Dontario Drummond from Ole Miss does a lot of those same things. Obviously, just he's going to be drafted a little bit later. 6'1", 215 pounds. He's tall. He's thick. He's not going to impress you in the open field with a, with a top-end speed. Uh, but this is a guy that was used really – look, he was an offensive weapon. Uh, you get him into the slot. You release him over the field. A lot of glance routes and little option routes, not a traditional route tree, um, but they just found ways to be able to get him the football, whether that was as a pass catcher or as a runner, as a punt returner as well. He dabbled a little bit there on special teams. He'll be a 24 year old rookie. But I think when you look at uh, Dontario Drummond, um, you know, the, the overall body of work, it really just his strength is after the catch. A lot of screens, the glances in the middle of the field, the RPO game, uh, get him the ball and let him work. And all the gadgets are all involved there as well, all the different orbits and screens and things like that. So uh, Dontario Drummond, uh, he's my pick there for day three. Now let's get to the uh, the dirty work, guys. You know, this is the, the players that are, are best without the ball in their hands, maybe on special teams, blocking. You can include the route running aspect of things as well. Uh, dirty work player, Dane, who's a guy that's – and these guys aren't going to get drafted on day one because of their ability to impact the game in this way. But uh, – who do you like here for day one? Yeah, you know, Jamison Williams, uh, he's got experience as a gunner. Uh, Chris Olave has a pair of block punts on his resume. Uh, but I'm going to go George Pickens here, who, who Ben mentioned earlier. Yes. You know, there, there's some overlap with him. You know, could go late round one uh, or fall into day two. But, I, I, you know, I don't know about special teams, but as a blocker, yep. this guy is super competitive, uh, almost to a fault. He, he needs to dial it back a little bit with that aggression. But you love the dog in him. Uh, he wants to drive defenders from their spot, loves to finish to the ground. Uh, that playing temperament is something we see, uh, you know, Ben talked about him in terms of ball skills, in terms of winning those contested windows, the 50-50 balls. You, he, that, that doesn't stop with him when he doesn't have – uh, the football. So that playing temperament at all times is, is part of the reason why I think he at least has a chance to go in round one. Yeah. He, uh, really impressive player, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, ben, how about you? Day two. What do you like here from that standpoint? 
All right, hitting you with a little Fennel special here. Two, two right. day two players real fast. John Mechie the third, I think, is an outstanding hard-nosed football player. Reminds me a ton of Robert Woods. I got news for you. All those bubble screens of Jalen Waddle and Devontae Smith. He's the one stock blocking and blocking his butt off for other people. A lot of blocking in the run game. I know there was the RPO aspect in that Bama offense where he ran a lot of slants and glance routes, but good receiver knows how to get himself open. He'll do some dirty work, do some special teams. And the second one, Alec Pierce out of Cincinnati, really strong player. I don't think plays nearly as fast as he tested or as nearly as explosive as he tested, but much stronger than I think anyone would uh, consider was a core special teamer early at Cincinnati and then just dabbled and let the younger guys do that. But a guy that wins at the catch point, strong blocker, go watch any short yardage Cincinnati Bearcats. They motion him in. He has tight splits. He's walling off defensive ends, climbing up the linebackers. He's a dirty work guy all day long. So Alec Pierce, six, three, two ten or so John Mechie about six foot one ninety. a little different packages tough players. Yeah, two players that are absolutely worthy of talking about here in this discussion. For me, I'm going to go day three, and this is another senior bowl player in Velas Jones Jr. from Tennessee. Uh, under six foot, 204 pounds. He's a big-time return man, and that's where he's going to make his value, especially in the kick return game. Uh, he's been, he has done that throughout the course of his career. He started at USC, and that's how he made his bones early. Continued that with the Trojans, then transferred to Tennessee and kept it up there. He was first team All-SEC, both as an all-purpose weapon on offense and as a return specialist. And I love that it was all purpose on offense because that speaks number one to the positional versatility as both a runner and a gadget guy, as well as a pass catcher, obviously, but also he is a really, really competitive blocker. And that, that edge that shows up on both faces of the game. There are times where he's back there as a kick returner and the other returner gets it. And you see him just like throwing blocks. Ben, I know you've posted a couple of those clips on social media of Jones throughout the course of his career. I think when you look at Velis Jones, he's another guy who's going to be a little bit older, 60 or senior, um, but he presents some of that, value to a team that looks to select him here when we get to next week. Uh, let's go to the player comps, guys. And uh, Ben, I'll come to you first. Uh, who's your favorite player comp uh, from these receivers here in this class? Well, we've been touching on George Pickens a little bit. Some boards, you might find him in the first, some in the second round. I think he's a really contentious type of prospect on where he's going to land because I think his upside and best football is ahead of him. But what type of player are we going to get? I see a lot of things that Devontae Parker did out of Louisville and then for the Miami Dolphins. Bit of a through and through X receiver, wins at the catch point, good size against smaller DBs. You can trust them blocking out there. I think Pickens may end up being a better player than Parker, but reminds me a lot of the same things that Parker was doing as a prospect. Another one I wrote down was Cortland Sutton. Yep. But Sutton didn't have the testing that I think Pickens did, but wins in a very similar yes. way at SMU with the Broncos. So Devontae Parker, Cortland Sutton, I think you're getting that type of player in George Pickens. I'm pretty sure I wrote down Cortland Sutton while watching uh, George Pickens. So that one definitely resonates with me. Uh, Dane, how about you? Uh, yeah, I'm going to pull a Ben. I've got a few here. Uh, yep. <laughs> uh, Danny Gray. Uh, if there's a Darnell Moody in this class, I think it could be Danny Gray uh, out of SMU. Uh, that's a great call. Vertical speed, gonna have some drops. He, he'll track the ball, but yep. I was gonna have some drops deep. Uh, but you know, a day three guy that could end up pushing for a starting role. I think Danny Gray could be that guy in that Darnell Mooney uh type of mold. Uh Garrett Wilson, I, I see a lot of uh CD Lamb with him, not the size, like yeah. CD Lamb was a little taller, a little longer, but and Garrett Wilson probably the better athlete, but in terms of the slender frame, the body control. And the catch point skills. I think th they, those two guys line up very, very similar. Um, and then I've got one for Jahan Dotson, but I'm, I know you're going to hit on him, Fran. So I, I want to hear yours first. All right. So mine's a little bit of a throwback because I, I am going to go with Jahan Dotson here. And I purposely left it off because I wanted to get your natural reaction when I, when I rolled it I out. I bet you guys picked the same guy. Just do one, two, three, and both say it at the same time. All right. Well, let's <laughs> do it. All right. Here, all right here, my, my, guy's, well, my guy's not a throwback guy. So my uh, guy's. Okay, all right, no, so Fran, you yeah. first. You first. All right. Okay. So to me, Jahan Dotson, you're looking at a receiver a little bit undersized, 5'11, 100, uh, under 180 pounds. That's, that's pretty slight. Right. And I think when you look, he catches everything. And I would say he's solid as a route runner. I think his best routes are those speed. He cuts, especially at the intermediate level. He just kind of runs through it and creates that separation. To me, he kind of reminds me. And think, I think back to like the the greatest show on turf. Isaac Bruce was an out. He was a maven on those speed cuts and it was automatic at the catch point. Uh, Jahan Dotson, Isaac Bruce. That's what I'm rolling with here. Uh, ben, you're shaking your head. I think I think you like that one. Well, I pulled out the Isaac Bruce comp for the very rare Devontae Smith profile yeah. prospect mm -hmm. last year. So I got to put that one to bed for probably 10 years before I pull another <laughs> Isaac Bruce out of the well. 
Yeah, <laughs> I think and to me, I, like if you want to like go with the recent time, I do think like there are a lot of things that Devontae and Desh- and Jahan kind of share uh, from that standpoint. Dane, mm-hmm. I'm interested to get your comp on uh, on Jahan. Well, I'm going Isaac Bruce. Yeah, no, it's no. Uh, so yeah, my my comp is far from perfect because uh, the the player I'm comparing him like John Dotson might have the best catch radius and ball skills of any sub five eleven right. receiver I've ever evaluated. Like he, it's he's that good uh, for that lack of size. Uh, Deontay Johnson with the Steelers, he had he's yep. you know the, the sure. drops frustrate you. But in terms of, you know, the athleticism, uh, you know, punt return skills, uh, you know, the route instincts, the, the okay. speed, I, I think that just watching them move, that's where I see some similarities between those two players. I like that. I could, I could definitely see that from, especially from a usage standpoint, uh, right. like you said. Who's a guy, guys, that's kind of sliding under the radar, we're surprised, isn't getting more love? Uh, ben, I'll come to you. Uh, I'd go with Eric Azakama out of Texas Tech who I think is competitive at the catch point, really tough yards after catch, extremely productive, good size, good speed, checks a lot of boxes as like a sixth, seventh, maybe first call you're making as a priority free agent type. He's a guy I think can really make a roster. One other one I'll throw in there. How about Bo Melton at a Rutgers? Track background, productive player, senior bowl. Another guy just caught in the wash of other receivers in this class. Bo Melton is a really, really good player, good kid off the field as well. I expect both those guys to go late day three. I like it. Dane, how about you? I'm going to go with Charleston Rambo from Miami, nice. uh, the Oklahoma nice. transfer. Uh, you know, think of all the really talented receivers that have come out of this program. And Charleston Rambo uh, set a school record this year for catches, for receiving yards uh, in a single season. I mean, th- this guy had a really productive year, uh, you know, with the inconsistent uh, quarterback. Uh, and I mean, obviously it got better as, as uh, Van Dyke got in there, but still we're talking about a, a young player here. And, and, but he was, he, he was outstanding. I, I think you have a guy that has length, has speed. Uh, I mean, he, he improved, he ran a four, five, seven at the combine, but improved that at the pro day with four, five, two. Uh, he has, has length to work with. He reminded me somewhat of uh, Cedric Wilson, former cowboy now with the dolphins. Uh, where you, you can line them up at different points in the field. Um, I, I think I think his skills translate. So I think Charleston Rambo, not being talked about that all that much, but you know, early day three, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see him come off the board. Consistently productive at two Power Five programs. Uh, I think when you look at Rambo, there's a lot to like there with that skill set. A lot of people forget he was at Oklahoma. Remember when Kyler yeah. Murray played Alabama in the playoff game, and he had that really cool play where he climbed up and flicked it like 55 yards. Well, the other side of that was Charles and Rambo catching right. the ball. Just a lot of the attention went to the quarterback and how fun the movement was in the pocket, but not super productive on the other end of Kyler Murray, but made enough big plays to definitely, uh, you know, sit up in your chair. And I think it reminds me a little bit more. I'm blanking on the Cowboys receiver. They just re-signed that catches a lot of go balls, very competitive Michael, at the catch Michael point. Gallup. Michael Gallup. Gallup. I see that mm. type of player. Mm. Yeah, I actually, uh, I mean, for me, like Rambo, uh, I remember studying Jalen Hurts in the first pl- the first game I studied at Jalen Hurts. It was like week one, week two of that season of 2019. Uh, he threw a quick slant on an RPO to to uh, the receiver, and the receiver just was shot out of a cannon, took the slant to the house, and it was Charleston Rambo. Uh, so what he did after the catch uh, stood out to me there as well. For me, I'm going to go with a guy that was a non-combine invite from Coastal Carolina, and that's Javon Hiley. Went to the Shrine game, and I think he just checks a lot of boxes. He's six foot, 200 pounds. He's got pretty good size. He's played a ton of football. He's got some production to him. Two time, two time first team all Sun Belt. He didn't test particularly great at the pro day, um, but he catches everything. He's a good blocker. He can p- compete on special teams. Uh, there's just uh, to me like there's a lot to like there with Javon Hiley. I, I see why he's going under the radar, uh, but he's a player I think is worthwhile uh, in terms of bringing to the conversation. Now, there are four players that I think are going to have that potential to go before in the top hundred for sure uh, that we did not mention. And so I'm going to go to you guys for some different ones here. Um, Ben, I'm going to come to you for Wandale Robinson from Kentucky because you've been talking about him uh, going back to the fall. So I want you to kind of give us a a little bit of a refresher there on Wandale Robinson. Uh, Afterwards, Dane, I'm going to come to you on two senior bowl guys in Christian Watson and Jalen Tolbert. All right, so we'll come to you for those two, and then I'm going to round things off with Justin Ross. Four players, all four, have a shot to go in the top 100. We didn't mention them at all this podcast. I want to make sure we give them some love. So, Ben, you first, Wandale Robinson. 
Wandale Robinson, one year at Kentucky, coming over from Nebraska. Very interesting profile. He's 5'11", 178, with historically short arms. This really isn't a true slot receiver, not a true running back. This is another guy that was in contention for the day two playmaker with Khalil Shakur, a guy you just want to kind of put the ball in his hand, saw more slot receiving RPO stuff at Kentucky. Nebraska, 133 rushing attempts. They put him in the backfield and run inside zone. So don't look at that 178 frame and think, Oh, he's slight. He's frail. He's just an over the top guy. He plays much tougher than that size would suggest. He's going to be a really good yak threat, good screen threat, really fast on quick game stuff. I put, uh, you know, Emmanuel Sanders down, Dexter McCluster as kind of a throwback comp there. He's a really interesting player and he's a young player as well, too. Born in January 2001. So he just yep. turned 21 years old. I think Wandell Robinson is going to be a really fun player. Just needs an established kind of role on the. The offense. Don't ask him to do uncon or don't ask him to do, you know, the traditional early down skill sets of running backs or being outside the numbers receiver, but find ways to get the ball in his hands. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to give you Robinson because I feel like he's a different kind of receiver than these two players and Christian Watson and Jalen Tolbert. Uh, Watson probably has the best shot of going round one, Dane. I'm interested to get your thoughts on both these guys who we got to see down in Mobile. Yeah, I mean, a few players have crushed the pre-draft process like Watson. Uh, going to the Senior Bowl and doing what he did there, Combine, uh, you know, coming in at 6'4", 210, and running a 4'3", 6. Uh, at the pro day, it was sub-7 seconds in the three cone. So uh, I think he needed that because the tape is just okay. It's not going to necessarily blow you away. Part of that is the offensive identity of North Dakota State. Part of it is – uh, you know, he is just, he's still very raw as a, as a, as a receiver. You see that in his routes. You see that um, I was talking with him. Oh, with Nate Tice yeah, just the other day. And he, he said, he, he put it in a good way saying he's a big receiver who plays small. Mm-hmm. And you see that quite a bit down the field. Um, and so he just needs to get better in some areas, some of these details. Uh, but when you have you're that size and at that speed, there's a good chance you get overdrafted. And so while Christian Watson, I think is more of a, a late second, in my opinion, second second round player. He could be a late first round player for a team, uh, depending on the grades. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if we're talking about him as a Thursday player uh, this year. And then Jalen Tolbert, uh, not going to blow you away with speed like a Christian Watson, uh, but he's so good. He's kind of the opposite because he, he's he's so good at throttling that speed uh, in terms of breaking cleanly at the stem. Uh, he, he's he's someone that uh, needs to get better in a few areas in terms of being more consistent, I would say, but uh, because he doesn't have that, those elite physical traits that are going to mask and uh, mask some of those false steps, but he's so fluid. Uh, he catches the ball well downfield. Uh, he's so, some people will point to, Oh, South Alabama, uh, you know, didn't play at a high level uh, in terms of his production, but this guy is recruited by Michigan state and some other power five programs coming out of high school and no, South Alabama never had a thousand yard receiver before uh, Jalen Tolbert, and he did it twice. So I mean, there, there's a lot to like about his profile, and you know he could be a starter, and that, that both these guys could end up being starters at the next level. No question. Uh, I think you have two guys that can win on the perimeter, downfield, all three levels. Uh, Watson, Tolbert, really, really intriguing options. And, and for me, uh, I'll round things out. Like I said, with Justin Ross from Clemson, one of the bigger wild cards in this class, regardless of position, uh, shows up to at Clemson and was a big time weapon for Trevor Lawrence. Forty six catches, a thousand yards, led the team as a true freshman in twenty eighteen, over twenty. 21 yards a catch, nine touchdowns. And then you go back and the, his sophomore year leads the team in receiving, uh, was a big time playmaker for Trevor Lawrence once again. Right. So I think when you look at Ross, there's a lot to like for what he did early on in his career. And then the injuries happened. So he got, he had the, the herniated disc that ended up becoming spinal fusion surgery in the, in the spring of 2020. He missed that entire season, came back this year, obviously a new look Clemson offense, new coordinator, new quarterback. The offense struggled a little bit. He had 46 catches, just over 500 yards and only three touchdowns. But I think when you look at Ross, if you're banging on, hey, look, he was a year removed from surgery. Uh, maybe now he'll, he'll get a little bit better. Uh, he'll get back to that that pre-injury form. You might get a, a really, really impressive wide out. Now, uh, he ended up not taking part in most of the pre-draft process, couldn't do the combine, ends up going to his, his own pro day. And he runs sub four, six, right? So that, that they are slower than four, six, I should say. So that, that certainly uh, doesn't help from that standpoint. But I think when you look at Justin Ross, who also fought off a foot injury uh, this fall, if he, if you think he can get back to where he was pre-injury, 
You've got a, a guy that's uh, probably a day one talent, uh, but at, at the end of the day, you got to worry about what he's going to be moving forward, but just a, a really, really fun player. And it's a sad story when you talk about the injuries uh, and what that did for him. He was the number one player guys in the state of Alabama coming out was a big time basketball player as well, but he was the first number one player in the state of Alabama to not sign with Auburn or Bama in like the history of recruiting. It was like, you got to go back years and years and years and years to find the, the number one guy in the state to not stay in state. Uh, and he was that guy for, uh, for Clemson. So uh, Justin Ross, I felt like a guy we need to make sure we included in this conversation. That said, let's put the, let's shut the door here in receivers potentially uh, and go to our next segment here. It's time now to go on the clock. Eagles fans, Merrill Reese here to tell you about the Eagles autism challenge presented by Lincoln financial group. This annual Ride, Run, Walk event supports autism research and programming as we work hard every day to advance the conversation from awareness to action. This year's event will take place on Saturday, May 21st at Lincoln Financial Field. With your support, we can help transform the lives of individuals affected by autism. Register today at eaglesautismchallenge.org. On the Clock. All right, guys, so every week here on On the Clock, uh, we do the exercise where uh, each of us gets get drawn a, uh, a random team, a random position, and a random part of the draft. I sent it to you last week when I sent you the rundown, so we've had a couple days to kind of let this stew, think about who we like, and give the reasoning. we got to think back to the way that all these teams operate, uh, and I drew the early pick here uh, for this episode. So I was drawn the Dallas Cowboys offensive line, in round one, which is definitely a possibility, absolutely something that's on the board. So when I look at the Cowboys, especially under Will McClay, since he took over as vice president of player personnel and uh, running the draft for the Dallas Cowboys, really the, the, some things stand out for them amongst their first round picks. Number one, toughness is paramount. They definitely have more of a focus on power five schools. They definitely focus on more of the name brand institutions from that standpoint. Uh, I was talking with Jeff Cavanaugh, Dana, a, a friend of yours, uh, Jeff Cavanaugh last year uh, on the podcast for our blueprint segment. And he said, one thing that stood out to me, so they really like being first on a position, getting it and making sure, Hey, we get the number one uh, offensive line. We get the, the number one receiver, the number one tight end being the ones to start that run. I thought that was an interesting anecdote. So for me, getting back to the offensive lineman, there were three options. And the reason I narrowed down these three options is that the, they have the, the Cowboys, one of the craziest stats when you look into this stuff uh, amongst uh, the NFL draft, when it comes to their top 30 visits and 30 visits can mean all kinds of things. It can mean that we want to get extra medical. We want to just bring the guy in and see how he is. Um, you know, we're working with everybody in the building. Cause that's the thing, the difference between a combine visit uh, and a pro day visit and a 30 visit is you get that player to be around into your ecosystem and get them to be around everybody in the building, as many people as possible. Now, some teams, that doesn't mean a ton. With the Cowboys, it means a whole lot. They consistently are not afraid to tip their hand with their intentions when it comes to uh, the top 30 visits. Over a third of their draft choices from 2011 through 2020, so you take the COVID years out because obviously nobody was doing visits there. A third, a th one third of their draft choices are in that nine-year span were from their top 30 visits uh, since 2004. The only first round picks that did not visit happy or did, that did not visit uh, the uh, Jerry world. DeMarcus Ware, who was a little bit off the board, right? It was a, from a small pass rusher from Troy. Mo Claiborne, who they draft, traded up for on draft day and a surprise move on draft day. And then Micah Parsons last year, who had, again, didn't make the visit because of COVID. Everybody else did a top 30 visit. So when I went through this exercise, I said, okay, who are the offensive linemen that have done the top 30 visits? So I arrived on Zion Johnson from Boston College, one of the best interior linemen in this class. Kenyon Green, local guy from Texas A&M and Bernard Raymond from Central Michigan. I ruled out Raymond because of the, the Power 5 lean. All right, so that takes me to Zion Johnson versus Kenyon Green. Guys, I'm going Zion Johnson here. And the reason why, again, we can always find these breadcrumbs. You can always connect the dots somehow. For me, Zion Johnson, you go to Frank Signetti Jr., who was the offensive coordinator at BC for the last two seasons up there for the Eagles in Boston. He worked for Mike McCarthy as his quarterback coach in Green Bay. They work together in New Orleans. They've got a long, long history together. Signetti since left. He's now uh, at Pitt, but he's coached, uh, he's coached Zion Johnson for the last two years. He's going he's gonna to be standing on the table uh, for his guy uh, when Mike McCarthy picks up that phone. What do you guys think? Zion Johnson, Cowboys, first round. I, I don't know why you're making me follow that. I mean, that was perfect. So that's exactly, <laughs> is exactly why Zion Johnson's going to be the pick at 24 if he's there. So, yeah. uh, I mean, I, I'm, that's, that's the direction I went in my mock draft. That, that's what I, if you, if the draft is tomorrow, that would be my guess, the, the direction they're going. And for a lot of the reasons you laid out. 
Nope. Is he their center of the future, left guard? Where would you where would you peg him there? My guess is he's probably the left guard, but yeah, pl- yeah. plug and play left guard. Yeah, plug and, and play then... left guard, and they, they could play him at center if they wanted to. But right. uh, and we know that they've definitely moved guys around as needed uh, on that offensive line lately. But uh, my guess is plug and play left guard. Now, I think there's a part of Jerry that just uh, he he's he really liked when it was just known that the Cowboys had the best offensive line in football Mm. and they've gotten away from that. And they, I think that bothers him and they want to get more explosive on offense. I'd be shocked if this pick is not an offensive player wide receiver will be tempting, but the opportunity to stabilize that offensive line with a plug and play left guard. I think that's, that's the direction they want to go. And some people will say, oh, why would you why would you draft a guard you know that early? This is a team that does a positional value does not apply right now to the to the Dallas Cowboys. They were fine taking a running back in the top five. They've taken guards in the top 15 before, and it's worked out just fine. Uh, right. And when you look at Zach Martin, certainly they took, they took Travis Frederick in the top 25 when that was a surprise. So no uh, tackle, yeah. nose tackle is the only position that they just they they're really do not look at nose tackles that they've yep. never really considered a nose tackle strongly, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Running back guard, other positions don't phase them uh, like nose tackle does. All right. Well, uh, Dane, let's come to you now. you got the Chicago bears who they don't pick until day two and you've got them Chicago bears day two edge rusher. So a team that traded Cleo Mack. Uh, let's see if they can get a little bit of juice here on the defensive line. Uh, give us the reasoning for, and who you're thinking here for the pick. So we have a first-year general manager uh, in Ryan Poles uh, and a first-year head coach with Matt Eberflus. So a little bit of unknown with both these guys in terms of uh, now that they're the ones making the decisions and, and you know pulling the trigger on these players, where are they going to go? And you look at Poles uh, coming up through the chief system. So he learned under John Dorsey, uh, Chris Ballard, uh, Veach, three very talented, but different evaluators in terms of what they prioritize. And so it's going to be interesting to see just where he lands. Obviously he's going to have his own spin, but I'm sure he picked up uh, maybe more from one of these guys than the other. Um, I mean, I remember being in the room with in Kansas city with John and Chris going back uh, when they were debating between Sean, uh, Shane Ray and Missouri um, I can't remember who was for who, but I remember that was a, that was a, that was a good conversation. Mm-hmm. I learned a lot. I took a lot of mental notes that day. Um, but size matters, testing matters. Uh, and I think that's something that's going to matter to these, uh, these two guys picking at 39, uh, it, it, early in the second round, I think, I don't know he's going to last this long, but I think the ideal pick for them might be boy Mafe, uh, from, from Minnesota. I, a guy that has the testing that can you know feel like there's upside there you feel like you can develop you feel like you're getting him not at his peak um I don't know that he makes it that far but I think that uh based off of this head coach this general manager I think that could be the direction they want to go I love it yeah it certainly makes a lot of sense do you think just you personally do you think Mafe makes it to that point uh at the end of the day I think Paul's former boss in Kansas City probably snatches him in the first, to be yeah. honest. Uh, but I, I think that's the type of player I think they want to go. So if, if Moffe is off the board, you know, do like a guy like Nick Benito, do they trust him enough for Matt, for Coach Iberflus? Is is a guy like Benito, does, can he be creative enough to use him where might be a little bit of a, little bit of a liability in the run game, but yeah. maybe you can move him around, let him spy, let him do different things? But we know what he could do as a pass rusher. His burst off the edge, that quickness. Um, I think Benito could be a, a possibility if Mafe's off the board, as long as you know Coach feels like he's on board with how that would fit in his system. Love it. All right, so Boye Mafe to the uh, the Chicago Bears there on day two. Uh, ben, you drew the uh, the short straw here in terms of the the late pick uh, for this exercise. You got a late day three for the Las Vegas Raiders. Defensive tackles. So we're going interior defensive line here. Uh, ben, who do you like here in, in this situation for the Raiders? I'm not going to lie, guys. I struggled. This is probably the yeah. hardest one I had to peg here for a variety of reasons. Obviously, late day three, so it's already forecasting who's going to be available at that point in the draft. Don't really know. But the Raiders, new GM, new head coach, new defensive coordinator, new D-line coach, and a big turnover of the roster. So no more Solomon Thomas. Quentin Jefferson's gone. Darius phylon has gone. You know, we added a couple free agents in Bilal Nichols, Vernon Butler to play next to big Jonathan Hankins. So what are we looking for? We need probably a one tech, you know, back up to Hankins and we can use some sub rushing juice. You know, that was kind of Solomon Thomas in 2021 was a sneaky, productive player. So the hopper guys I'm considering here, maybe Neil Farrell out of LSU is a sixth, seventh rounder would be a nice backup to Hankins. Maybe Otito Ogbanano from UCLA, another nose tackle, one shade type. 
But the guys with a little bit more juice, a little bit more versatility, I'm, I'm looking at. Thomas Booker out of Stanford, who his stock and profile is really starting to heat up with his athleticism and ability to play different spots. But I'm actually going to go with Matthew Butler here out of Tennessee, a guy that I think could play one tech in a pinch, probably a through and through three tech, a guy that is very stout, very heavy on contact can get up the field with the first step. He's a guy that I think is a perfect rotational depth piece to figure out what you have. Some of his best tape in the SEC was against the best competition. I think Matthew Butler is a perfect type in round six, round seven out of Tennessee to fill out your D-line room, get this new era started with the Las Vegas Raiders. Fun uh, tidbit about uh, Matthew Butler, high school teammates with Harold Landry. That's how far back he goes. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie, Ben. If, when this exercise started, I kind of thought that might be the name you go with. If I had to pick one name out of uh, to try and guess, uh, you go Matthew Butler. So I'm glad. Uh, I was just trying to peel back some layers and get some yeah. sort of semblance of like, where are they going with this? You have a lot yep. of former Patriot guys with Ziegler, the GM, Josh McDaniels, even Patrick Graham, the new defensive coordinator, spent a lot of time in New England as well. So then, you know, Graham was with New York where they had snacks and Dalvin Tomlinson, the new D line coach, Ocum come over from Carolina where they spent, heavy capital on Derek Brown a few years ago. My brain is all over the place here. I'm just, where are they going? What position? What's the scheme going to be like? Are they working on depth? Do they need a starter? What type? I don't know, guys. So if you have some darts to throw at a board over here, uh, I welcome some some, uh, attempts. That was a good one. Well, it was a fun exercise, as always, uh, like we try and do here on On the Clock. Good stuff. Ben, Dane, we will talk to you guys later right here on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the Draft Mailbag. Good stuff there from Ben and Dane, as always. Now, uh, let's wrap things up with our Draft Mailbag. And again, the best way to hit us up is to go on over to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Spotify. I promise we will answer your question. If you get it in there now, leading up to Draft Weekend, leave it. We will answer it before the draft hits. But you got to do it fast. you got to get there soon. Make sure you get there. Leave that question in the response column, and we'll get to it here in an upcoming episode. We've got two that we're going to hit on here in this episode. And first up, we've got PA321CK, who left a five-star review over on our Apple Podcast page saying best draft podcast, love the content, Fran brings it to you in all kinds of digestible manner that you start to think it would be easy to figure out. Well, I, P- I appreciate the PA. Uh, I realized after years of listening, it is best to familiarize myself with possible options for the Eagles and see which you would prefer. Fran, would you choose, roughly in the order I would rank them for each pick, at 15, Andrew Booth, Jordan Davis, Jamison Williams, Devontae Wyatt, or Drake London, or at 18, Chris Olave, Trent McDuffie, and Devin Lloyd. So, uh, PA, obviously, you left a, a bunch of really good options there. And I look, I think there's there's positives and minuses to all of these players, right? Once you get to the middle of the first round, uh, obviously, all of these guys are going to have some sort of weaknesses to their game, to their profile. I think when you look at Andrew Booth, uh, he's got you have a small sample size, right? He was only a really a one year starter. He started a handful of games last year as well, but really only a one year starter. Uh, this pre draft process, he's gotten dinged up, uh, hasn't been able to participate participate in the combine pro day and then eventually uh, got a surgery that he should be ready for day one but I think when you look at Andrew Booth you're betting on the small sample size that you've seen and with that small sample size we've seen a corner that is smooth that is explosive who has outstanding ball skills and can come down and make a tackle one-on-one as one of the more physical corners in this class so there's a lot to like there and then when you take a look at Jordan Davis from Georgia the big defensive tackle uh, look the I think the positives and minuses uh, they kind of are, are set for themselves right with Jordan Davis you have have a mammoth defensive tackle who is dominant against the run and really is just going to provide upside as a rusher. He has not been productive. He wasn't asked to necessarily be productive in that scheme. All of those Georgia linemen uh, have warts in the in the stat column, but I think when you look at Jordan Davis, you are betting on the upside and that his most productive football could be ahead of him because he tested as an otherworldly athlete, arguably the number one athlete in the history of the pre-draft process when you take his weight into account. And I think when you look at that and you say, okay, uh, that might be a worthwhile gamble at number 15 overall, and there's, that's why a lot of people feel he may not be there when the Eagles are on the clock next Thursday night. But Jordan Davis, that's the, the pluses and minuses there. Then you get to Jamison Williams, who uh, only one year of production transferred in from Alabama. He was a former Ohio State receiver who just couldn't find his way into the starting lineup. He transfers to Alabama after they lose their top pass catchers, obviously one we know here well in Devontae Smith, and Williams goes nuts. He was an absolute playmaker for Alabama this year on their way to the national title game, where... 
he tore his ACL, right? So you've got one year sample size and you've got the torn ACL, but you have arguably the best game breaker in the NFL draft this year, really on offense, period, not just at the wide receiver position. We talked about Jamison earlier in the show. Then you get to Devontae Wyatt, who I think you talk about the same, same kind of deal as Jordan Davis, except when you get to Devontae Wyatt, Look, the, the production was was not consistently there. He's a little bit of an older prospect. He's a fifth-year senior, right? And not just a redshirt senior, but he got that extra year of eligibility. Otherwise, he would have been in last year's draft. And had he gone, entered last year's draft, he would have come into the NFL with single-digit sacks and single-digit TFLs. Now, he still has single-digit sacks, but I think you, you look at his best year came this past season for the Georgia Bulldogs. And so you're saying, okay, can he continue that ball rolling? Can he keep snowballing this into a productive early start to his NFL career? He's a little bit older, but you start to check a lot of boxes in a guy that can defend the run. He can get after the quarterback. He's a high-motor player, high-character guy. There's a lot to like there from that standpoint with Devontae Wyatt. And then you get to Drake London, who, from a profile standpoint, there is a lot to like, right? With Drake London, he's going to be one of the youngest rookies in the NFL this year. Uh, it will be just 20 years old, 21 years old. He's got outstanding size. He can get up and go up and get the football. He was extremely productive this year. His first year as a starter on the perimeter. He was a slot guy before that. And I think when you look at Drake London, he's been a basketball player and has played both sports throughout the course of his career. The first time where he was focused solely on football, that was this last fall in the best season of his career. So if you say, okay, he's going to be all in on football moving forward, how much better is he going to get with the, with improved coaching and improved situation around him? Uh, the Drake London, there's a lot to like there, but not a lot of guys with his size and skill set have necessarily always hit in recent years, right? So there, I think, one, long story short, uh, CK, I think when you look at this group, there are going to be pluses and minuses to all of them. It's all a matter of which one are you willing to embrace. I don't know that I can say which one of this group uh, would get me the most excited or the least excited, uh, but I will tell you that there is a lot to like about this entire group of players. Even when you get to that group of at 18, that, that trio there of Olave, who I think is outstanding, polished, and that's the thing. You know, Chris Olave, he's a senior wide receiver. He was polished and one of the best route runners in the country, not just in 2021, but you go back and watch him 2020. You go back and watch him as a sophomore in 2019. He's been the same player throughout. So that same polish, that same consistency and how deliberate he is as a route runner, every movement is with a purpose. Well, that shows up uh, over the course of his entire career uh, at Ohio State. Trent McDuffie, he has just been rock solid. He just does not give up big plays. Uh, the, the turnovers aren't necessarily there. He doesn't create big plays either, but he doesn't give up anything over the top. He's quick. He's versatile. He's tough. He's a good tackler. There's a lot to like. And then Devin Lloyd, uh, you would say the same thing. I mean, the production the past two seasons for Devin Lloyd, linebacker at Utah, has been astronomical. He's been outstanding. Um, but it's all about uh, making sure that you know from an eye from an eye discipline standpoint, everything is there. But all the tools are there for him to be a big time playmaker in the NFL he's a good size kid a great athlete so there's a lot to like uh, so CK a lot of good players are bringing up there as possibilities for the Eagles in round one last question here Ethan Giles at a five-star review asking about Drake London's versatility he said hey guys love the pod I have a question about Drake London's versatility in the beast Dane Brugler noted on Drake London's weaknesses that he lined up almost exclusively on the left in 2021 then in his most recent seven round mock draft Dane mocks Drake London to the Eagles and said he can play in the slot or outside as the X. I'm a huge fan of Dane and all of your work, so I don't want this to come off as picking nits, but it seems like those two statements are incongruent. Can Drake London move around the formation? I ask, especially as an Eagles fan who has heard Nick Sirianni speak endlessly about how important versatility is at the wide receiver position and how he doesn't have a traditional X, Y, and slot receivers. When I read the beast and I had initially crossed off Drake as an option for the Eagles because of that seemingly lack of versatility, but if he has it, then I could absolutely see why the Eagles would want to get him. Thanks so much for putting this all together. Well, this is easy, Ethan. Uh, in, in 2021, he lined up to the far left. In 2019 and 2020, he was there primarily a slot receiver. So that, that that's where you get into uh, the versatility. It's not just from last year, but it's over the entire body of work of his career. He was a primary inside option running down the seam, and he was a monster between the hashes for USC early in his career. After Amon Ross St. Brown graduated and moved on to the NFL, well, they slid him outside, and he became the primary pass catcher. That same role that that, uh, that Michael Pittman had a couple of years ago, the same role Amon Ross St. Brown had in 2020, well, that's where Drake London stepped in on the perimeter and made big plays for USC until he had that ankle injury back in October. So uh, good question there from Ethan. Thanks so much for everybody for listening here to the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand. We'll be back later this week, the draft just over a week away. Stay tuned for more right here on the Journey of the Draft podcast presented by Life Brand.